Hello, constant readers. <laughs> um, it's been kind of a sad, strange day, but driving over here, I was thinking that it wouldn't be the first time that Stephen King has allowed us to escape from the real scary world um, into a different scary world, <laughs> um, but still. Also, I think that tonight is maybe the best way to start Halloween month. Um, I'm gonna skip the part of the introduction where I go over the facts and figures and awards because I'm pretty sure that everybody here is familiar um, with what Stephen King has done. He has um, sold more books than you. Um, he sold more movie tickets than you. Um, and he has more Twitter followers than you. Um, but I do want to go over some of his other accomplishments that um, don't have as many statistics attached to them. Um, let's see hands for who stayed up half the night reading a Stephen King book. <laughs> um, how about who stayed up half the night because you read a Stephen King book? Um, Hands for how many people stole their first Stephen King book off of their parents' bedstand. <laughs> and what about who has connected with somebody because of a Stephen King story? Yeah, I think that is what's really cool about Stephen King. Um, so Missoula is a community of writers, and I wouldn't be a writer if it wasn't for Stephen King. Um, being in my childhood and through my adulthood. And I've heard so many writers in town say the same thing over the years. Um, yeah, he's written some of the best horror stories in history. Um, but I also want to acknowledge his fantasy books, Hands, if you like his fantasy books, right? Science fiction, like um, his recent one, 11, 63 yeah. Um, he's also written some of the best characters um, that I have remembered for years after reading the book, and they all come back to me at different times. Uh, recently, I've heard Dolores Claiborne whispering at me a lot. Um, she says to me, sometimes being a bitch is all a woman's got to hold on to. Yeah. He's uh, also written some of my f favorite writing about writing, um, including the following words, um, which I've told myself so many times, including backstage just now. Um, the scariest moment is always just before you start. After that, things can only get better. True of writing and life. Um, we are so lucky that Stephen King got through that scary moment and started writing for us. Um, tonight, Stephen King is here with his son, Owen. Um, Owen has written one novel, double feature, a graphic novel, Intro, into Alien, intro to Alien Invasion, and a novella. Um, we're all in this together. Uh, he also has a bunch of short stories that have been published in places like Prairie Schooner and One Story. Um, most recently, they teamed up and wrote the, their newest novel, Sleeping Beauties, um, which is about what would happen if all the women in the world went to sleep, um, which certainly sounds like the beginning of a horror story um, <laughs> for men. Um, Owen came up with the initial concept and the pair switched off writing and editing the novel from beginning to end. Um, I cannot wait to read it um, or to hear from the authors. Please welcome Stephen and Owen King.
Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to Sarah for that wonderful introduction and to uh, Shakespeare and Company for making this all happen and the University of Montana. This is great. Thank you, guys. Uh, so we have been uh, touring around now for 30, 40 days in support of this book and um, honing our act. And um, <laughs> what, we, what we have found works the best is that uh, we both read just a little bit from the book, and then uh, we have some questions that we ask each other. And then tonight, we're very excited. We have a, like a stack of note cards that came from all of you. Uh, and we don't know what's on those. We know they're questions, hopefully. And uh, we're going to ask each other uh, some of those. And so that's what we'll do. Sound good? All right. I'm just going to read a short passage uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, a lot of the action in Sleeping Beauty takes place at uh, a women's prison uh, called uh, the Dueling Correctional Facility for Women. We actually named it after one of our favorite writers, uh, Rick Dueling, uh, who should be in prison. <laughs> so um, the, 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 the uh, passage is from the perspective of Janice Coates, who's the, who's the warden of the prison, and it has to do uh, a little bit with her, uh, at least in passing, with her relationship with Clint Norcross, who is the prison psychiatrist and, and uh, an even larger character in the book. And uh, Janice is, is very crusty uh, and a, a sort of uh, perpetually aggravated civil servant, but Ultimately, she, she does some, some really good things. All right. Bullshit was Coates's arch enemy. Not that most people were friends with it or even liked it, but they put up with bullshit, came to an understanding with it, and they dished up their fair share. Warden Janice Tabitha Coates didn't bullshit. It wasn't in her disposition, and it would have been counterproductive anyway. Prison was basically a bullshit factory. Call it the dueling bullshit manufacturing facility for women. And it was her job to keep production from raging out of control. Waves of bullshit memos came down from the state that demanded she simultaneously cut costs and improve services. A steady stream of bullshit flowed from the courts. Inmates and defense attorneys and prosecutors bickering over appeals. And coats always seem to get drawn in somehow. The health department loved to drop in for bullshit inspections. The engineers who came to repair the prison electrical grid always promised that this would be the last time, but their promises were bullshit. <laughs> the grid kept right on crashing. And the bullshit didn't stop while Coates was at home. Even as she slept, it piled up like a drift in a snowstorm a brown drift made of bullshit. Like Kitty McDavid going nuts and the two physician's assistants picking the exact same morning to go AWOL, that stinking pile had been waiting for her the moment she stepped through the door. Norcross was a solid shrink, but he produced his share of bovine excrement too, requesting special treatments and dispensations for his patients. His chronic failure to recognize that the vast majority of his patients, the inmates of dueling, were themselves bullshit geniuses. Women who had spent their lives nurturing bullshit excuses was almost touching, except that it was Coates who had to wield the shovel. And hey, underneath their bullshit, some of the women did have real reasons. Janice Coates wasn't stupid, and she wasn't heartless. Lots of the women of dueling were, above all else, luckless. Coates knew that. Bad childhoods, horrible husbands, impossible situations, mental illnesses medicated with drugs and alcohol. They were victims of bullshit as well as purveyors of it. However, it wasn't the warden's job to sort any of that out. Pity could not be allowed to compromise her duty. They were here, and she had to take care of them. Thanks. It's really nice to be here. The last time I was in uh, Montana on Route 90, I was on a motorcycle and it was, it was snowing. <laughs> and uh, 
Does the weather here always suck? I mean, I'm sure it gets nice some of the time. <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're staying at a, at a hotel that's near a river, and uh, I went into my room, and I look out, there's a view of the river, and there's a guy out there, it's raining and it's cloudy and everything, and the guy is fly fishing, and it made me think of that movie, A River Runs Through It, and I thought to myself, uh, the hotel hires this guy. He's, <laughs> he's there to try and give people that Montana vibe. Anyway, <clears throat> So I want to read something. Uh, I've read it before, but I picked it out tonight on purpose because uh, you probably know that a another dysfunctional ass munch went nuts in uh, Las Vegas uh, and killed a whole bunch of people and wounded hundreds of people. And uh, one of the things is, I saw this book as a chance to, in an organic way, without preaching, getting up on a soapbox, you know, it's a story about all the women in the world going to sleep. They fight to stay awake, uh, little by little, you know, you can't stay awake forever, so they fall asleep, they grow cocoons, uh, leaving the men. And uh, I thought without getting up preaching or anything, this was a chance to talk about the essential differences between men and women without, you know, trying to preach at anybody. So this scene takes place in a bar room in the town of Dooling, named after our favorite writer, Richard Dooling. And uh, you should buy his books. <laughs> you should buy his books. Uh, Rick will take our check <laughs> out back afterward. Anyway, yeah, right, thanks. Um, so this is in the, the bar, the squeaky wheel, and uh, the, this aurora disease has started to take hold. And uh, there are still women around, there's some in the bar, but uh, more and more of them are going to sleep, and naturally the talk turns to the things that we always discuss when tragedy strikes. What happened? Why did it happen? Where do we go from here? A man in jeans, a blue chambray work shirt, and a case gimme cap was on his feet and holding forth, gesturing with a half-full pitcher of beer, and those around him had grown silent listening respectfully. He looked familiar, a local farmer or maybe a long-haul trucker, his cheeks speckled with beard and his teeth discolored from red man, but he had a preacher's self-assured delivery, his voice rising and falling in cadences that begged for return cries of praise Jesus. You may hear me stumble a little bit here because I'm, I'm uh, condensing as I go along. Sitting next to him was a man Frank definitely recognized, having helped him select a dog from the shelter when his old one died. Howland, that was his name, teacher from the community college over in Maylock. Howland was looking up at the sermonizer with an expression of wry amusement. We should have seen this coming, the trucker preacher proclaimed. The women flew too high like that fellow with the wax wings, and their wings melted. Icarus, Howland said. I Icarus, that is correct. That is a big 10-4. Want to know how far the fair sex has come? Look back a hundred years. They couldn't vote. Skirts down to their ankles. They didn't have no birth control, and if they got abortion, they went down some back alley to get it, and if they got caught, they went to jail for murder. Now they can get it done any time and place they want. Thanks to plan fucking parenthood, abortion's easier than getting a bucket of chicken from KFC and costs about the same. <laughs> they can run for president. They can join the SEALs and the Rangers. They can marry their lesbo buddies. If that ain't terroristic, I don't know what is. <laughs> All in just 100 years. The trucker preacher lowered his voice. He could do that and still be heard because someone had pulled the plug on the jukebox, killing Travis Tritt in a dying gurgle. <laughs> they ain't just pulled even like they said they wanted. They done pulled ahead. Do you want to know what proves it? Now Frank had to admit the man was getting close to something, something that might even be the truth. They can dress like men. That's what proves it. A hundred years ago, a woman wouldn't have been caught dead in pants unless she was riding a horse, and now they wear them everywhere. What you got against long legs and tight pants, asshole, a woman called, and there was general laughter. 
Nothing the trucker preacher shot back. But do you think a man, a natural man, not one of those New York trannies, would be caught dead on the streets of dueling in a dress? No, they'd be called crazy. They'd be laughed at. But the women, now they get to have it both ways. They forgot what the Bible says about how a woman should follow her husband in all things and sew and, and cook and have the kitties and, and not be out in public wearing hot pants got even with the men, they might have been left alone, but that wasn't enough. They had to get ahead, had to make a second best. They flew too close to the sun, and God put them to sleep. He blinked and rubbed a hand over his beard's scratchy face. Icarus, he said abruptly, and sat down. Before the general conversation could start up again, or before someone could plug in the juke and reanimate Mr. Tritt, Howland stood up holding a hand in the air. History professor, Frank suddenly remembered, that's what he said he was, said he was going to name his new dog Tacitus after his favorite Roman historian. Frank had thought that was a lot of name for a Bichon Frise. <laughs> My friends, the professor said in rolling tones, with all that has happened today, it is easy to understand why we haven't yet thought of tomorrow and all the tomorrows to come. Let us put morals and morality and hot pants aside for a moment and consider the practicalities. This gentleman has a point. Women have indeed surpassed men in certain aspects, at least in Western society, and I submit they have done so in ways rather more important than their freedom to shop at Walmart ungirdled and with their hair in rollers. Suppose this, let's call it a plague for want of a better word, Suppose this plague had gone the other way, and it was the men falling asleep, not waking up. Utter silence in the squeaky wheel. The women could restart the human race, could they not? Of course they could. There are millions of sperm donations, frozen babies in waiting, stored in facilities all across this great country of ours, tens and tens of millions across the world. That would result in babies of both sexes. Yes, yes, and even if that were the case, women could continue to reproduce for generations, possibly until Aurora ran its course. Can men do that? Gentlemen, where will the human race be in 50 years if the women don't wake up? Where will it be in 100? Now the silence was broken by a man who began to bawl in great noisy blabbers. Howland ignored him. But perhaps the question of future generations is moot. He raised a finger. History suggests an extremely uncomfortable idea about human nature, my friends, one that may explain why, as this gentleman here has so passionately elucidated, women have got ahead. That idea, baldly stated, is this. Women are sane, but men are mad. Bullshit, someone called. Fucking bullshit. Howland was not deterred. He actually smiled. Is it? Who makes up your motorcycle gangs? Men. Who comprises the gangs that have turned neighborhoods in Chicago and Detroit into free fire zones? Boys. Who are the ones in power who start the wars and who are the ones with, the exception of, few, of a few female helicopter pilots and such, who fights those wars? Men. Oh, and who suffers his collateral damage? Women and children, mostly. Yeah, and who shakes their asses egging them on, Don Peters shouted. Who's pulling the fucking strings, Mr. Egghead smart boy? There was a spatter of applause at that. Thoughtfully put, sir, the contribution of a true intellectual and a belief that many men advance, usually ones with a certain sense of inferiority when it comes to the fairer sex. Here is an interesting fact, Howland continued. During the second half of the 19th century, most deep mining operations, including those right here in Appalachia, employed workers called coolies. No, not Chinese peons. These were young men, sometimes boys as young as 12, whose job it was to stand next to machinery that had a tendency to overheat. The coolies had a barrel of water, or a pipe if there was a spring nearby. Their task was to pour water over the belts and pistons to keep them cool, hence the name coolies. 
I would submit that women have historically served the same function, restraining men, at least when possible, from their worst, most abhorrent acts. But now it seems the coolies are gone or going. How long before men, soon to be the only sex, fall on each other with their guns and bombs and nuclear weapons? How long before the machine overheats and explodes? Thanks. So I, I, I usually ask Dad to talk a little bit about how we did this collaboration, but first I, I want to tell you how the idea started, which was that uh, it just sort of came down from the, from the ether to me, and I, I thought to myself, what if one day all the women in the world didn't wake up? And uh, uh, I should say, at the time, my, uh, my child was much younger, and so I think the best I can do is I was sleep deprived, and so sleep was on my mind. <laughs> and so I, I, I thought of this, this idea came to me, and, and right away I thought to myself, it would be awful. And, and then right away I thought of my dad. <laughs> and uh, I never, I, I've never before come to him with an idea that I thought he should write, because this is something, you know, he can't do anything without somebody you know, wandering up to him and being like, hey, Stevie, I got your next novel for you right here. Um, you know, literally, he can be taking a leak at a urinal and somebody will shoulder up beside him and be like... Want to hear a real horror story? Yeah. <laughs> and so... Uh, and so I, I said, I called Dad up and I... I gave him this one sentence idea, and I said, what do you think of it? And he said, that is great. And I said, perfect, you go ahead and write that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and we went go back, and, that shit. We went back on, and forth man. for a while, and he, would, he wanted me to write it, and I said, no. And he just refused to accept my gift, and eventually we compromised <laughs> and on collaborating. So do you want to tell him a little bit about how we, we did it? Yeah, uh, the first thing that we thought of, I mean, this was Owen's idea. Owen said, you know, there are a lot of uh, wonderful long-form TV shows now, like Breaking Bad and The Handmaid's Tale, and although that wasn't out when we started this, this seemed like a pretty long process before we got done. But Owen said, what if we did this as a limited series uh, for TV, like 10 episodes? So we, we started that. We actually wrote one episode and most of another one, and Owen calls me up and he says, Dad, this isn't working. Uh, I want to go deeper than this. I want to take some of these peripheral characters and fully develop them, uh, and I don't want to do that in that format. What would you think about a novel? And I said, that sounds like a, a really good idea. And Owen said, what we want to do is to write a novel that doesn't feel like a collaboration, you know, that feels like one person not Steve King, not Owen King, but a third person wrote this book. And to that end, we kind of swapped back and forth. We had an idea of where we were going, and the, the more we did it, the, the more uh, we, we knew. Um, we knew that it wanted to have a woman's prison in this little town called Dueling, and uh, that's based on Richard Dueling. You should read his books. <laughs> I'm a fan of White Man's Grave myself. I think that's a nice one. It's available, you can get it. So anyway, uh, what Owen said was, we'll, we'll play tennis with this. We'll swap it back and forth. We know where we're going. We'll talk about it a little bit and keep it sort of, but in the middle of each section, we're gonna leave a blank space and the other person will have to fill that in. It was like, you know, I would write blah, 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 and... Literally. Then, right. You, would, you wouldn't believe the amount of work I did. No comment. Anyway, so 
so I would write blah, 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 and then he fainted in front of the sawmill or something like that, and I would say, oh, and fix that shit, you know? <laughs> so we left those donuts for each other, and that's how we did the book, and we ended up with something that felt woven, tightly woven, and then, you know, we went into it with the idea, uh, no crying, no tears, we're going to rewrite each other, and... Uh, come out with something that feels like it's totally blended. And then you add in the editorial process uh, to that and all the rest of it, and we came out with a book that really does feel like a third person wrote it. And that's the way we did it, and you can do it too. <laughs> <laughs> so, since, since we were just talking about uh, inspiration, such as it is, the other day, we don't rehearse these questions ahead of time, so he could throw anything at me. I screwed right. him last night bad. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Uh, the, other, uh, the other day, I asked you about... Uh, I don't, have you guys heard of It? The, uh, I, I asked him... Um, You know, he, he always jokes, he always says, uh, you know, people will ask him, well, where do you get your ideas? And he always says, you know, there's, a, there's an, I, a used idea shop in Utica, New York, where he gets them. Um, but, you know, when you, there is some sort of, uh, uh, you know, moment or thing you notice, there is some sort of activating thing before you start writing a story, even if you don't have it all. Uh, it, I think it almost never like lands fully formed in your lap. But so I, I asked you uh, where you started with it, and I because I, I was thinking to myself, maybe you saw a kid with a little boat, maybe you saw a sewer grate, maybe you saw a clown. I didn't know, and I was curious, like what was the what was the uh, instigating moment? And you told me a really interesting story about that, and then and I and I want you to tell them that if you don't mind. Um, but then you, you also will, said to me, you also said to me <laughs> that you didn't even really remember the guy that wrote that stuff. And so I wondered, what's changed over the years? Who was that guy and who's the guy now that writes books? But tell me a story. <laughs> yeah, and then maybe something else will occur uh, about the other thing. I'll tell you one thing, the clowns of the world fucking hate me. <laughs> they do. Uh, I just tell them, you'll all float. <laughs> no, I mean, hey, I, what I do say is, uh, don't, don't, hate the, uh, don't hate the messenger for the message. It just, all at once, it seemed like everybody in the world had this clown phobia. But anyway, way back uh, around the time that uh, we lived in Boulder, Colorado, I had written a book called uh, The Shining. And... <laughs> feel like Leonard Skinner getting ready to play Freebird here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd written that, that book and another one called The Stan. <laughs> and I was driving somewhere in, in Boulder and I had car trouble and uh, there were no cell phones in that day. I just sort of pulled over and I, you know, found a pay phone, called my wife and said, have them tow this car to the garage, we'll get it fixed up. And she said, well, what, are you, what about you? And I said, I'll walk home. And I walked through a park in Boulder, and uh, I had on a pair of old cowboy boots, and there was a little hump bridge there that went across a little creek. And as I walked across it, I could hear my boot heels. They got a really hollow clump, clump sound. And I thought of a fairy tale from my childhood, uh, Three Billy Goats Gruff, and the, uh, the ogre underneath the uh, bridge, and he says to the billy goats, who is that trip-trapping on my bridge? And I thought, you know, that, that would be a good story. There's a good story there, only an ogre really doesn't cut it, and a bridge doesn't really work, but what if it was like something in the sewers looking out, and there was this little kid who came along, and I thought, well, you know, a clown, kids, it would be... <laughs> 
really good because kids are scared of clowns a lot of times. Uh, so I'm still trying to make it up to the clowns of the world. But that was the genesis of the idea. And if you ask me what the difference is between the guy who wrote that book, who was in his 30s, and the guy who's here today, uh, the pat answer is 35 years. <laughs> um, but there's something about getting, getting older that's a little bit like that story of the frog in the pot. You know, you continue to turn off the heat, uh, turn up the heat a little bit at a time, and the frog says, geez, everything's really good in here because I'm getting used to it until he boils alive. And uh, I just thought that was a cheerful thought for a, you know, to compare getting old to a frog boiling to death in a pond. Because I think that's sort of comforting, don't you? That's it is, it is. So I feel the same, but I know that my production is slowed down and that I have more of a tendency to... Uh, think about what I'm writing than I did. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. Um, tell them about uh, the child labor that you did that I forced upon <laughs> sure. you and your brother and your sister. When I was about uh, seven or eight, I decided that I wanted his money. <laughs> and, but I was going to have, I, he wouldn't just give it to me. I was going to have to do something. And, uh, you know, normally that's when you start mowing the lawn and, and whatnot. But he, at that time, had uh, discovered books on tape. And I don't know if you've read him on the subject, but he loves books on tape. And they were actually on tape at that time because this was the 80s. <laughs> and, uh, but again, because it was the 80s, you couldn't just get everything. Um, you know, there, there were quite a few books on tape at the time, but it's not like now where you go to Audible and every book that's ever been written is there. Uh, so he hired me to, he got me a tape recorder and a big block of cassettes from <laughs> Sam Goody. And he assigned me The Watchers by Dean Koontz. And <laughs> he... He would give me, at that time, I think he gave me six or seven bucks a tape, which was really good money. And, uh, and I read it, and uh, first of all, imagine that, you know, any eight-year-old you know reading you a Dean Koontz novel <laughs> and what that would be like. And that's true, that's both, you know, patience and his incredible patience, and boy, he really wanted to hear his Dean Koontz book. Uh, but you know, it, it's uh, s sort of, without ever noticing it, I continued to do this job all through my childhood and, and adolescence and through my teenage years. Uh, I, don't think very con I don't think he did this consciously, but it was in a lot of ways a great education for becoming a writer because my dad never assigned, you know, never hired me to do the same kind of book twice. I did Dean Koontz and I did James Herbert and I did Tolkien and James Elroy and all kinds of mainstream. You did Dune, Look, boy, that was quite a. Oh, job. I didn't like that one. That was one. I just remembered this. I every once in a while he would he would give me something and I wouldn't like it, and I'd get like kind of pissed off, and so I would start doing weird voices. <laughs> and that was one where I did I did a bunch of really stupid sounding voices, but he you know he listened right right all the way through. But anyway. I think if you aspire to become a writer, one thing that's really important to do is to read around and to not just uh, not just live inside the area of the writing world that you want to work in. You know, if you want to write mysteries, don't just read mysteries. You gotta you gotta see how some other people do things and and you know borrow from from that and really really open yourself up to that. Um, and I think it will it has a, an enriching effect. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, the thing is, uh, after a while, they discovered that I liked the books on tape so much. Uh, we live uh, in Maine, and it's, there are long drives everywhere. You know what I'm talking about because you're in Montana. Uh, <laughs> so I listened to a lot of them, and after a while, they started to give me, for Christmas, one of the nicest Christmas gifts I ever got 
was uh, uh, Owen and his, his brother Joe, who writes as Joe Hill, uh, they collaborated on uh, The Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie, and that was a terrific, that was a great I, I forgot all about that. Yeah. I, I, we did do that. We we, did do you that. did do that, and, and uh, then a couple of years later, for my birthday, Owen had kept telling me, oh, I'm gonna give you this wonderful present for your birthday. And the birthday came, and you know, what I got was some shitty little novelty or something, and he said, I, it isn't ready. And the next year, he'd say, it's going to be great, it's going to be great, but it wasn't ready. So finally, what he gave me was the complete, unabridged reading of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. <laughs> and it took him so long to do it that the first 17 hours were on cassette tapes and the rest was on CD because the technology <laughs> changed. True. Sure. But I love books on tape, and I, I love audio books because they're like extreme close-ups in the movie. Uh, if you listen to a, if you read a book, you get, your eye kind of can skate. But when yep. you listen, every imperfection, every bad word choice, every infelicitous phrase shows up. It just, they, they clunk. So, I like them. Anyway. And, and I've gotten so that I, when I read my copy, Owen, I will, and you ought to do this yourself, you. <laughs> I'm kidding. But you know what, you, when you uh, read it aloud, sometimes you see what you were supposed to do. Anyway, do you have a Yeah, I have question? a question for you. So the other day, we were signing books before the event, and I said to him, do you want to borrow my nice black pen that I've been enjoying using and sign some books with it and we'll swap. I could use your blue pen, you could use my black pen. And he goes, no, black is death. <laughs> I can't use that. And, you know, two, two, I thought two things. One, what a weirdo. <laughs> and, the second thing I, I thought about was knowing him the way I, I do, I know that superstition plays a huge role in your everyday life. And what, what, is, what is the relationship between superstition and your writing process? Well, first of all, those superstitions aren't hurting anybody, right? <laughs> and, you know, the thing is, okay, I gotta, I gotta tell you guys something. He's right about the black pens. I have all these pens, and you see they all have blue tips, okay? And the thing is, I have never died using one of these pens. <laughs> I mean, never. So, I, I do have superstitions, and superstitions, okay, are the outgrowth of OCD behavior, obsessive compulsive disorder. There's, uh, when I see, you trained yourself out of this, I think, but when I see crows or ravens uh, on the road or a black cat, you go like this and it takes off the bad luck and it always works, okay? <laughs> um, when you're reading a book, uh, let's say that you're on page 85. Well, it doesn't hurt to read another page because eight and five add up to 13. 13 is an unlucky number. <laughs> and I... Can I ask you a question? When you do that, are you, do you have to read to page 87? Because if you stop at page 86, you've really only read 85 pages. Well, the important thing... <laughs> no, 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 no. The important thing is to get that number off the page you're looking at. <laughs> and once you turn the page, and the worst thing is, the one that you absolutely have to look out for, is when chapter 13 starts on page 139, or 131. But you see, there's a serious aspect to this, and that is, anybody who writes novels will tell you, Owen will tell you himself, Owen is married to a writer, Kelly Braffitt, who writes wonderful, wonderful books, also available at bookstores near you. <laughs> uh, 
My wife writes novels. They're available at a bookstore near you. Tabitha King, check her out. Make wonderful presents. But, no, I, I, I'm just fucking with you. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to say is this. It's a lonely, scary job because you say to yourself, what happens if I get to page 600 or something like that and I realize that this thing just isn't working, that it's a train wreck? So, in order to armor yourself against those fears, you build up certain habituated responses, and superstitions are part of those. But any writer will tell you that they have a number of uh, rituals that they go through uh, before they sit down to write. And it's part of this auto-hypnosis thing that puts you in the zone where you can do the job. What's the deepest you ever gotten a book on quit? Man, I'll tell you what. I wrote a book uh, called The Cannibals, and I got in about 450 pages, and I had no idea what to do. Uh, you know, I, I tell you what. I, I also wrote a long story called The Women's Room. It was a great idea. The idea was this guy and this, his wife. Can I tell this? Do you mind? Uh, I, don't, I don't. I've never heard the story before, so I don't okay, know. Okay, a man and his wife. They're going on a trip. Uh, somewhere, they're at the airport, and they're hurrying to get their plane, and the woman says, honey, I'm just gonna use the women's room here for a minute. And she goes in, and, and see, what I was thinking is, at that time, I mean, now they have unisex bathrooms and everything, but this was like 25 years ago, and I thought, whoa, that's the one place that even Superman can't go. So, uh, <laughs> although there was this story about how all the uh, women who worked at the Daily Planet had radiation burns. <laughs> Never mind. So, anyway, so the woman goes in there, but she doesn't come out. And while the guy is waiting for her, uh, another man comes up with his girlfriend, and she goes in to use the ladies' room, and she doesn't come out. And this keeps happening. And uh, pretty soon there's eight or nine men out there and they've missed their, uh, their, some of them missed their planes and some have missed their connections. And so then a woman security guard comes along and the men prevail upon her to go inside and find out what's going on and she doesn't come out. <laughs> so I saw this thing where they would go and get the head of the airport security and he would go in and disappear, and they would get the, the chief of police, and finally the FBI would get involved, Homeland Security, everything. Except I could never figure out what the fuck was going on, so. <laughs> so I dropped the story. I dropped the story. Should so, we, should we do, the, should we take, do the, uh, sort of like use this as the intermission before well, we start on their questions? Do you want to ask me? Before, I just, okay. one of the questions for you was, trace the path, of some of the writers that made you feel like you wanted to do this job, besides me. <laughs> uh. You're blanking. Well, I mean, I think. Who do you You mean? know, you're the example, you know. When I was growing up, I didn't really want to be a writer when I was a, I was a kid because both of my parents were writers and I, I loved reading and I loved telling stories, but I also knew what their job was actually like, which was that every day they would go upstairs to their respective offices. Actually, my mother's office was downstairs and she would go across to her office and he would go upstairs to his office. And then from like nine to four, nine in the morning to four in the afternoon, they would just be in there typing. And you could hear it rattling down through the house. And, um, you know, I had this fairly misbegotten idea that uh, you could make a great living as a writer, that that was pretty easy from them. Um, <laughs> but what didn't look that easy was that they went up into their offices for seven hours a day alone and just worked incessantly and uh, so I knew that writing wasn't something that uh, that writing stories and writing novels it didn't just um, like happen in a burst of inspiration it was a grind and not everybody who, who writes novels has time to work every single day but 
everybody who does it has to find all the time that they can get for it. And uh, it's just, you know, it gobbles up so much time if you're really serious about it and if you really want to do that, uh, if you really want to do it. And I found that so daunting. And um, so when I, when I finally, you know, got into my college years and I still enjoyed writing stories and I, and I never stopped being a reader, uh, I knew that it was something that I was really going to have to make a commitment to. I was going to have to write all the time the way that they did. And so... And so that's what I started to do, and that's what I what I still do. Um, but that was probably the you know there were a lot of writers that inspired me when I when I was a kid and all through my teenage years. But I didn't necessarily want to be a writer at that time because I knew it was hard. Yeah, that question was from Alicia, by the way. And uh, oh, I you sneak! That, you skipped into the questions. Well, I, I wanted to know. And I ha just happened to see that was on top, you know. All right. So, you, you, some of you may have heard about this. What we have been doing, he's turned 70 recently. And, uh, and so Thank we, you. I came into possession of the Stephen King quiz book. <laughs> and... What, we, what I like to do every night is to test him to see what's left, <laughs> to see what, he's re, what he remembers. And we do a different, we, when I started this project, I would ask him biographical questions. To, I would, we would always do a biographical question to start with, what's your middle name? Where were you born? What are the names of your children? And he got all, almost all of those right. Uh, but so now we just we just cut right to the novels, and I do a different novel every night. And so you killed me last night. Last night, night he fucking bombed. It was <laughs> awful. He 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 got like one out of four questions. I asked him four questions. He got one out of four right on Eyes of the Dragon, and I'm stretching to give him the one. You know. So I was drinking pretty heavy in those days. <laughs> All right. So tonight I thought. I have a theory on this. We're going to do Christine tonight, and I think that he's going to do well because I think he's going to remember the car stuff. Yeah. I just think that's, that's the kind of thing that sticks in your mind, Christine, but we'll see. I got this knob. <laughs> All right. So we're at, you got your four questions. Who? Four questions. Who was Arnie's first love, his only true love? Christine. That's right. And what was Christine? What kind of car? Christine was a Plymouth Fury, I think a 1957. 56? I think it's an 8. 58? Well, one of those 50s. All right. We'll, take, we'll accept that. I didn't I wasn't. I, I, the, the car was a bonus. The car, just Christine was enough. Okay. Who was Arnie's best friend? First and last name. Jesus, he wrote the book. I mean, he's the narrator of the book. Uh, you uh, throw these things at me, and like there's a thousand fucking people out there. <laughs> it's pressure. I don't. Dee, 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 dee. What's his? What was his name? Did anybody remember? Anybody Dennis. know his last name? That's right, Dennis Gilder. Dennis Gilder. All right. All right. Where does, what is the name of the town? The girl's name was Lee Cabot. Yeah, you got, that's not the question, though. That's not the question, yeah. Where does Christine take place? Pittsburgh. No. Monroeville? You got the right state. It's not Pittsburgh? No. <laughs> it's... Well, the book says it. Maybe it's wrong. I didn't write the quiz book, but I think it's right. It's Libertyville, Pennsylvania. Oh, I made it up. Shit. Okay. <laughs> is it supposed to it's be? It's really Pittsburgh. It's really, really Pittsburgh. All right. Okay. All right. Last question. This is the really, really hard one. This just makes me think of that Joe Pesci thing about, oh, they always fuck you at the drive-thru. <laughs> Last question. Last, remember, 
he's written 57 novels and he's 85. What am I? One what? <laughs> am I one for three here? No, I think we would say two to... Well, I mean... You got Dennis, right? Didn't yeah. you? Okay. Did I? I don't think uh, I did. Last question. This is the hard one. What hit and killed Dennis's cat, Captain Beefheart? A garbage truck? Oh, so close. <laughs> it, was a, it was a UPS truck. A UPS truck. All right. Those are hard questions. <laughs> so this I is a... I was pretty heavy when I wrote that one, too. So let's see. Let's try to let's okay. Let's we're going roll. to the, audi we'll, we'll, going to the uh, audience questions. Yeah, let's roll through these. And this question's for both of us. It says, "What book are you reading?" Patricia asked this. What book are you reading right now? I'm reading a book called uh, uh, "Under the Ground" by Peter Robinson. It's a it's a mystery novel. It's good. I'm reading "Get Shorty" by Elmore Leonard. It's terrific. Get Shorty. Yeah. yeah. This is also for both of us. I'm very, this is from Barlent. Barlent. I'm very excited to be bringing my 14 year old granddaughter, Ella, to this event. Ella would like to know who inspired Stephen and Owen to become who they are today. I know who inspired him, Satan. <laughs> If I had to pick anybody who really made me want to write the sort of stuff that I write, it would be Richard Matheson, who did The Shrinking Man and I Am Legend. Yeah. I, I think my mom and dad, for sure. Oh, that's that very like sweet. All right. So, you can stay in the will, son. <laughs> okay, here's one for you, Owen. How did your dad's accident impact your relationship? I got hit by a guy who was driving a thing, yeah. yeah. How, did it, how did it impact our really? Uh, mm, well, I mean, it's, you do everything that you used to do. Yeah. You're not as good at tennis as you used to be. No, it's true. Um, it would have changed our relationship more if he died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about that, though, is... Uh, and this, this is a true story. I was in the hospital for about a month. I was all busted up, and I was high on drugs a lot of the time, and I was in pain. And you know my older son, uh, Joe, he writes as Joe Hill, and, uh, and so he's crazy about movies, and he said, Dad, Dad, he comes into the hospital. He says, I brought this, this DVD. It'll really oh, cheer yeah. you up. I remember this. And we're going to watch it together, and I'm thinking, like, Okay, it's a movie. I guess I can do it. I'm getting pain medication in half an hour. You know, I was on fire from the, from the waist down. I said, what's the movie? He says, it's called The Blair Witch Project. <laughs> and then you haven't lived until you were high on dope watching that shit. Right. So this is a question from Robin. It's just for you, Dad. It's, what, are, what are the three books you enjoyed writing the most? The three books that I enjoyed writing the most? That's what the, the question is, yep. Lisey's Story, which I really, you know, I, I like that one a lot. I mean, it's not a crowd-pleasing favorite, but I, I loved that book. And The Stand, because... <laughs> because I was just lost in that world, and uh, I felt, when I was writing it, like uh, I was in another world. It felt right, uh, that, that's all. If I had to pick a third one, I would probably say Mr. Mercedes. <laughs> and the reason why was, it was a new territory for me. It was uh, the idea of trying to write about you know, a, a cop story. And this wonderful character named Holly Gibney walked on in the middle and just kind of stole the book, and I love that. When, the, when a character does that, you let him. So we answered this one. This is from uh, Rick, uh, wants to know about 
my accident and our relationship. Here, here's one for both of us. This is from Jack. What are some tips to get high school students excited about reading and writing? Well, you can offer them booze. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you what, I think that if you give uh, high school kids something that, uh, that they really turn on to, and they will, uh, with the right thing, um, I had great success when I was teaching high school with Deliverance. There were some of the parents that were a little bit mad about it, and we ended up naming a couple of characters. Yep, yep, the uh, Griner Brothers. The Griner Brothers in our book, named after characters in Deliverance. So I had some success with that, and... Uh, if you can get them excited about what they read, uh, then they will write. And sometimes you can free up their imaginations, and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I'll t you know I mean, you've got to find things that are accessible that, to, you know, a kid that's 15, 16, in 2017, you, you know? Like, it's not necessarily... Yeah, you've got to find something that, that's accessible to them and that it isn't going to, uh, you know, make the right-wing side of the whole school district up in arms, you know? Right. Because, because, you know, there might be something in there about, oh my God, sex. <laughs> and you know, 14, 15 year olds don't know about sex, so <laughs> it's a good thing. But at that time, uh, when I finally broke through and wrote for a living, I was thinking about going back uh, uh, and getting a teaching certificate for elementary school because my wife always told me that the Catholic Church's motto was, give them to me while they're young, they're mine forever. So <laughs> I, I thought I could get them before they decided that school was dumb. Okay, here's a, here's a question for you, Dad. Are you never going to let me ask any questions You just did. You? you just asked me one a second ago. No, you okay, interrupted me. Okay, ask me, sorry. All right. Do you have, what are your outside interests? What ambitions outside of becoming a writer? That's from Heather. Uh... Well, I have a family. My family is my, my chief interest outside of writing. Yep. Uh, baseball. Um, the Red Sox, specifically. The Red Sox. Uh, I don't know. I like listening to my records. <laughs> I actually, this is maybe kind of pathetic. I've been thinking about getting into, I, like many men my age, I think that I have longed to learn to paint the little lead figures, like for Dungeons and Dragons. And I, I want to get, um, like, I, I read a thing about how you do it. It's, so you that's, shit on me for my superstitions? Like, I want to... <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is that I, I'm thinking about, like, getting into painting Dungeons and Dragons figures is my thing. So let's talk about something else right away. <laughs> no, let's talk about that some more. I, <laughs> Is there... Dig it a little deeper, Owen. Go ahead. Okay, this is from Heather. Is there any advice... No, Heather's question is, is there any advice you could give other authors who struggle with physical ailments or accidents like you had to keep writing? What kept you going through the pain and disruption in your life? A lot of accident questions tonight. That takes me back to a dark time in my life, but... I'll tell you something about that, though, and you might not know this, or, or you might, but my wife uh, used to be after me to slow down a little bit. She would say, you know, don't spend your life in your office living with these stories that are made up in your head. Get out and live life and enjoy life and all that. And then I had that accident. I got busted up pretty bad, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether all wives are magic or whether it's just my wife is magic, but uh, I was in the hospital for about a month, and when I came home, I was miserable. And I, when I got hit, I had been about a third of the way through a, a nonfiction book called On Writing. And uh, it was sitting there uh, all the time that I was in the hospital. And when I got back, uh, I was all... You know, I had an external fixator on my leg, and I was all bandaged up, and I was miserable. Uh, and my wife had set up a little office, a little writing area uh, downstairs uh, with a, a child-sized desk and a child-sized chair. And 
uh, a laptop, an early generation laptop. And she said, you need to go back to work. I mean, I was gobsmacked by that. She said, you need to go back to work. And she was right. And it was, it was hard, but for those two hours a day that I worked, uh, I forgot to paint. I got into what I was doing. It was good medicine. So that, that's something that I, I would just give people the advice. If you have a, a disability, you have a drawbacks, uh, the first thing is to keep working. And the second thing is remember that uh, it's grist for the mill. It's something else that you have in your experience bag that you can write about. This is a question for both of us. How are you going to carve your pumpkin this year, Robert asks. <laughs> I'm going to let you do it. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's, a, that's something I come up with in, this, in the moment. You don't carve pumpkins. You're not going to carve any pumpkins. No, I'm not going to carve any pumpkins. Uh, we're, we're getting to the end of, of uh, what we should do. We should let you get out and enjoy this beautiful, balmy Montana night. Uh, we really, you know, would rather stay here. We have to go on after a couple more stops to Florida, and we will hate to leave, <laughs> we will hate to leave this weather behind. But. Yeah. It's nasty down there, as you know, but we will try to uh, live beside the Gulf and enjoy it a little bit. <laughs> so, here's a question from Jill. Did you ever think your dad was a little odd when he came up with some of his stories? No, uh, it's, uh, you know, it was just what he did. That was totally normal. Totally normal. Little did, little did I know. One so, more Owen, and then we'll call so it good. So this question's from Bob. Bob. What the, what the fuck is wrong with you, he wants to know. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can I tell the story, the supermarket story, real quick? Yeah, yeah, tell us. Publix supermarket. in Florida, okay? I'm walking around. I'm doing my wife's little shopping on Wednesday or something like that. I come around the corner, and there's this woman in one of those carts. They scare the shit out of me. You know, the kind that you sit in and drive. I'm always afraid somebody's going to have a stroke and die, and the thing's going to go, go maximum overdrive on me. But she's, she's like, you know, perfect Florida, 116 years old, the golf tan. And she looks at me and she says, I know you, I know you, you're Stephen King, you write those scary stories. And they're all right for some people, some people like that, but I don't listen to any of those myself. I like uplifting things like that Shawshank Redemption. And so I said, I said, I wrote that, and she said, no, you didn't. Okay, what's the All point? right. This is a pretty good one to go out on. This is from Dawn of... Of all the movies that have been adapted from your novels, which is your personal favorite and which is, was the worst? What's your favorite of the movies that you've seen that were made up? Um, I'm curious. I think that my favorite is The Shawshank Redemption, I think. Yeah, I think that's mine too. You, you know what I the one I really like um, that no one ever talks about is Secret Window I really like. Johnny Depp, that was good. Yeah. That was good. There's been a number of ones that I thought were really sort of good and interesting, and uh, I've made sort of a career out of, if somebody says, I'd like you to make a movie out of your work, my response is, uh, have a good time, and we'll see what happens with it. So, And uh, speaking of a good time, We've had one tonight, Emily. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. And thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.